what made you um, think up this idea of a digital archive? Um, I'm not real certain the exact impetus for the idea, but I do know that uh, when I came to Ohio State University um, just about 10 years ago now, uh, one of the things that was happening in our culture was the um, Story Corp project for NPR. Right, so I knew about that project. And I also knew that our profession did not have a uh, central repository or even a public repository of narratives about literacy practices, values, understandings, experiences, activities that everybody in the profession had access to. So we had no shared um, resource that we could use to examine literacy uh, and to understand collectively what we were looking at or talking about. So uh, I was at a very uh, small university, Michigan Tech, in the Upper Peninsula of Michigan, right, it's Upper Peninsula right there, and uh, Michigan Tech is right up, right up at the very top, right? Uh, so, uh, and it had moderate um, resources available for faculty, and certainly because it was an engineering institution, humanities faculty had even more moderate uh, resources. When I came to Ohio State, um, I knew I was going to a large flagship institution with a lot more uh, resources and resources available to humanists uh, in English studies. And I also knew that I was going to a place where there were people like Louis Ullman and Scott DeWitt and Kay Halasek and Nan Johnson, Beverly Moss, Brenda Brugerman, all of whom had an interest in what I would call literacy uh, and graph, Harvey. Um, and so uh, to me, it seemed a natural activity to want to study um, literacy. I already like stories. I just like telling them and I like listening to them. Uh, and I wanted to put the resources of the university behind a project that would benefit the entire profession. Um, something that would give every English teacher, every student of English uh, access to narratives about literacy so that literacy could be studied more systematically um, and um, so that we could have like a common corpus like linguists do. Linguists often operate a, out of a common corpus uh, and we didn't have a common corpus of literacy narratives. Uh, so I wanted to build one. I wanted to make it available to the profession for the benefit of the profession. So why digital? Explain a little bit about why you decided on a digital archive. Well, everything almost I do is based in um, in digital context, uh, and the digital networks uh, then and now uh, provide, to my way of thinking, such expanded, extended, amplified reach and scope of projects. So many more people can get involved uh, in uh, participating and uh, contributing and also um, accessing these narratives because they're in, a, in a, a common public digital archive and that's what I, I knew a digital context would bring. But in order to do that I needed um, more expertise than I that I had, and that's why Louis Ullman was my partner in crime on this uh, digital archive. Louis had all the experience necessary to um, think about some of the technical aspects of that digital context, um, forming it, shaping it, structuring it. And he also had a lovely grasp of um, uh, preservation methods from his work with libraries. So, but he's married to a, an award-winning librarian and uh, 
he managed to uh, combine those two things in a very artful way when we were talking about and planning the digital archive of literacy narratives. So tell me about a story about an early experience in creating the DALM. Well, I can, I can tell you a couple of stories. I can tell you about the hardest time we had creating the DALN was um, getting the uh, Institutional Review Board, the IRB, approval for that um, particular project. We had to get a project IRB so that um, the project of the digital archive could be done at various sites. And uh, that was a very difficult um, uh, effort. It was an effort, I think, that challenged my own impatience. And um, I am not good at, um, at persevering when I think people want me to go through certain set steps. I'd rather do an end run or a, you know, something that would uh, get there quicker. I'm impatient when I do projects. Louis Ullman is the antithesis of that. He is absolutely patient and systematic and um, very cool and collected. And during that first year, it took us an entire year to get IRB approval. And there were times when I was about to leap across the table and, you know, grab a hold of the lapels of the people on the other side, attorneys and people in the IRB office. I was just not ready to hear no for this project or do this first, that second. I was, I was ready to roll. So Louis, fortunately, uh, took us in a much more systematic way toward the final conclusion. And uh, it was a good thing he was, he was there and he was such a terrific uh, co-director of this project. I, I, we, it wouldn't exist today without Louis Ullman's uh, insight and perspective and tenacity and intellectual like approach to the whole thing. Um, I would have been banned from the university, I'm sure, within an, a week of trying. Uh, so that was one story. It was the difficulty of getting IRB. The other story I can tell you is um, when we finished constructing the digital archive uh, after we got the IRB uh, approval, we had to <laughs> seed the collection with, or the archive with certain collections of narratives so that there'd be something there for people to look at. It wouldn't be just like an empty bucket, right? And so um, my idea would be to go to scholars that I knew, Brenda Brueggemann, Beverly Moss. I went to Brenda and I asked her if we could do um, deaf and hard of hearing uh, citizens and if she'd help us with that effort, which we did. It's a, still a collection in the digital archive and a, it's used all the time by people because it's, uh, it includes uh, not only the question, the interviewer plus the um, participant, but a translator, a sign, signer and translator, uh, and there's simultaneously voice and signing. So that was a terrific exercise for us. We learned a lot about how different populations uh, need to be uh, accommodated with both the technology and the setting and the, you know, wh what different kinds of questions that prompted, what kinds of involvement that prompted, who might be involved, how we might go about doing it. And then the second question, the second incident was when um, I went to Beverly Moss and I, um, thought we should do uh, black women academics because Jackie Jones Royster was here, Valerie Lee was here, there were many people I knew would be terrific participants. Um, and so I started this effort by sending out an email um, to all of the black women academics on the campus that I knew. Um, and I sent out this email asking for their involvement and I didn't get a single blessed email back, none, zero. I was, it was busted, it was nothing. I got nothing back. And 
I was just discouraged and I went over to Bev's office, her office is right down the hall, and I said, Bev, you know, what's happening here? What What is happening here? And she was very patient in explaining to me how often these women were approached um, because they are in a sense so rare within the academy, um, so rare within our culture in some regards. Uh, so many duties and obligations devolve uh, to them and uh, they have so much on their plate and they um, for good reason don't trust all the people who come to them asking uh, for involvement um, for very good reason. Uh, and so um, Beverly schooled me a bit on that and uh, with uh, great kindness and generosity. And then she sent out uh, a similar email <laughs> message and within like two minutes got back all sorts of responses and as a team we went back and we interviewed people um, sometimes in groups sometimes alone black women academics and uh, had another population with which to seed the DALN so I learned a lot from Beverly and from Brenda about what it takes to actually carry through in a project like this and how different populations um, will approach the task of telling a story and thinking about what it means to tell a story uh, in very different ways and that the DALN had to be, had to not just accommodate but seek all those different voices and be ready to, um, to adjust its practices and its uh, collection efforts and its um, the the whole project to all those different voices because every single voice that we listened to had something unique to tell us about literacy.